Hi, this is Gary Rubenstein, and this is part one of a series of lectures about what's known as Feynman's Lost Lecture. Now, Richard Feynman was a famous physicist who won the uh, Nobel Prize, and he was also a great lecturer. Well, he did this lecture on March 13, 1964, explaining why planets go around the sun in, in an ellipse. And what was lost about this lecture was the, um, they had a tape of it, and they also had photographs of his diagrams on the blackboard. They, they lost both of those. But then they found the tape, and they found his lecture notes. And two uh, professors, uh, David L. Goodstein and Judith R. Goodstein, um, wrote a book called Feynman's Lost Lecture, where they reconstruct his lecture. And I'm uh, attempting to explain it in my own way using uh, the technology of geometry sketchpad. Now, in the early 1600s, uh, Kepler did, uh, created three laws of planetary motion, and he did this through observation. As, and I have here an animation of a planet going around uh, the sun. Uh, a couple of things that, that he noticed, and he made conjectures based on his observation. And the first observation is that uh, the planet is not going around the sun in, in a circle, circular orbit but instead it appears like it's going around in an ellipse. So that was one of Kepler's three laws, that the planet actually goes around the sun in an ellipse where the um, sun is at one of the two foci of the ellipse. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about ellipses in a bit, but an ellipse has, a, uh, has two focus points. Another thing to notice is that the planet seems to be speeding up as it gets closer to the sun and slowing down when it gets further away from the sun. And what Kepler conjectured is that the planet is, um, is speeding up and slowing down according to a bit of a, of a rule, which is, which is this. If some time goes by, the planet, um, we say, sweeps out in an area on this, on this ellipse. So if, if a few seconds goes by, it creates some kind of a uh, some kind of like a sector of a circle. I'll I'll, I'll um, draw it like this. So here I have the planet at one time, and here I have the planet, you know, a, a little bit later. And I'm going to animate this again. Look what happens when it slows down. Uh, the triangle gets skinny. Here the triangle has a bigger angle in the middle, and when it's slowed down, it's got a smaller angle over here at, at the vertex. And what Kepler's conjecture was, was that planets sweep out equal, t equal areas in equal times. And that kind of dictates the way that it speeds up and slows down. It has to speed up when it's closer to the sun to get that same area. But since we have this big distance to make the height of this triangle more, it sort of slows down according to that rule. And those were Kepler's conjectures. Now, Isaac Newton, in the late 1600s, he... Um, he wrote a book, uh, The Principia Mathematica, where he proves that these, um, that these, that Kepler's laws are correct, that, that the planets do go around in an ellipse, um, and also this equal times uh, sweeping out equal areas also, among other things. And he does it by starting with a more fundamental conjecture, which is what he calls the, the inverse square law. Now, Newton's proof is very difficult to follow, and that's why Feynman, he does a modified version of Newton's proof that's simpler to follow, and I'm going to take you through that proof today. Now I'm going to start, uh, as Feynman does, by describing some properties of an ellipse. Here you have an ellipse with uh, two foci, f and f prime. Now, if I were to put a point on the ellipse, which is point P. And I can move this point around on the ellipse. Uh, one thing about this point P uh, that every point P on the ellipse would, ha would have in common is if I measure the distance, in this case from, uh, from F to P, it's 2.36 centimeters, and from F prime to P is 4.69 centimeters. If I move point P around, those numbers change. But what doesn't change is when I add together those two numbers, 
what happens is that I get, in this case, 7.04 inches. Watch what happens as I move P around. The FP and PF prime, those change, but the 7.04, which is being constantly recalculated, is staying as 7.04. So that's property of an ellipse that any points on the ellipse has the property that the sum of the distances to, to the two foci is a constant. In this case, that constant is 7.04. This property that the combined sum of the uh, two distances from a, a point on the ellipse to the two foci is a constant uh, gives us a real clever way of creating an ellipse by starting with a circle, and this circle has center F. Now what I'm going to do is put a random point in the circle, which in this case is over here, but it could be, it could be anywhere in the circle, and that point is called F prime. Now what I'm going to do is pick a point on the circle. Uh, one observation to realize is that if you measure the distance from F to that, uh, to that point, it's going to be 7.04, and if I, um, let me just call this something different, if I move that point around, it will stay 7.04 because that's just the radius of the circle. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a line segment that connects H to F prime. And then on that line segment, I'm going to make the midpoint. And I am going to then make a perpendicular line. So this is the perpendicular bisector of H F prime. Now there's a property of perpendicular bisectors that if I have a point on a perpendicular bisector, I have this point K, which is on the perpendicular bisector. And if I measure K to H, it's 8.76. If I measure K to F prime, it's also 8.76. So any point on a perpendicular bisector is, as we say, equidistant from the two endpoints of that segment. Now, keeping that in mind, I'm going to make a line segment now that connects F to H, which is a radius of the circle. And finally, I'm going to make a point right here, the intersection of that radius with the perpendicular bisector. And I'm going to call that point P. Now, I want to prove to you that FP plus F prime P is always going to be a constant which is equal to the radius of the circle. And here's why. HP has a certain length, which is 4.85 inches, and that's going to be the same thing as F prime P. And that's because P is on the perpendicular bisector of H F prime. So H P has the same length as F prime P. And I can mark that like this and, and like that. So H P and F prime P are congruent. Now FP plus HP is always equal to the radius. As you can see, FP plus HP is just the radius itself, so when I add them together, I always get 7.04. But remember, HP was the same length as F prime P. So because of this, when I add together FP and F prime P, I'm also going to get the radius. Now, if I take all the different points that P can take on, it's going to make an ellipse.